the beginning, God. Today I'm going to begin a message series that I cannot tell you how long it will last, but I want to go into um, the first four words of the Bible and really dig it out. Uh, in the beginning, God. Now, here is what I need you to understand, that if we are not solid on the first four words of the Bible, the rest of it is going to be ununderstandable. And if you don't believe the first four words, then uh, the Bible is just going to be something that doesn't make uh, any kind of sense to you. You don't get it. Uh, you don't necessarily believe it. You just do what you do. You go through the motions. But if you truly believe that in the beginning God, that begins answering a whole lot of questions. That, that answers a lot that are out there. Um, I want you to know that this sermon has been building in me for uh, months and months, this series has, and I begin putting it together. And it seems like now is the right time because there are a lot of people asking questions about things. I regularly sit with college students who have questions. They're going through evolutionary biology, and they have questions. They're saying, I know what the Bible says. I believe the Bible. But I don't know how to think about this because they're telling me something totally different than the Bible's telling me. Pastor Mike, what should I believe about this sort of thing? And my answer is always the same. You believe the Word of God above all else. Everything else you can throw away. You can dish it, uh, put it, put it in a dish and drop it in the garbage can if you want to. Because if it is contrary to the Word of God, it is not of God. Do you believe that? Say amen. So, this series is going to be aimed at our students, both elementary, junior high, high school, college, whatever your status may be, and probably will answer a lot of questions or maybe create more questions in your mind for those of you who've already been through college and studied things of this nature. Um, we have a daughter that graduated LSU School of Nursing back some years ago. And she came home right in the midst of her evolutionary biology class. And she said, Dad, if I wasn't solid on what I believe, I would latch into those lies that my professors are telling me. She said, but I know what the Bible says. I know what I believe. I know what God's Word says. And I believe it above all else. And here is the way that, uh, I don't know if she ever did it, but I certainly gave her this admonition. I said, Tabby, I know and I understand what you're telling me. But you have to pass the class if you're going to become the RN that you want to become. So you have to pass that class. So here's what you do if you feel like you need to uh, basically make your stand known. You answer the question on the test the way the professor wants to hear it, the way they want it answered. You answer it, and then you put a little asterisk by your answer, and you go down to the bottom of your page, and you... Put another asterisk where it directs your attention to that and say, this is not what I believe, but it's what I have to say to pass this test. Now, whether she did that or not, I don't know. She passed with flying colors and now is an RN and, and is very educated, very uh, mature in the Word, very mature in her nursing profession, and she loves Jesus with all her heart. So what I'm telling you is this is that there's a lot of stuff being taught out there that people have decided to fill in the blanks because we don't have answers. And they've decided to fill in the blanks with lies, with stuff that's made up, with things that make sense, but there is absolutely zero proof for it. We're in an all-out attack today from Satan on the origin and the, or the beginning of time, beginning of the earth as we know it. And Satan is trying to bring confusion into the minds of the young people and have them to question whether God is truly the creator and even if God exists. And it's not only our schools, it's our political system if you follow that very closely. It's, it's the media, it's television. Christ, God, creation is all under attack all the way through. Now, I want to make this well known, and I'm going to say it long, and I'm going to say it loud. As your pastor, I want you to 100% know that I believe the Bible is the inspired, infallible Word of God. 
There is no questions about it. It is the Word of God. You can trust it. You can build your life on it. You can build your practices on it. You can build your, your habits on it. You can build everything around the Word of God because you can trust it. It is tried and it is true. And it is not like modern day science that changes from week to week. It is not. The Word of God is about 3,500 years, the oldest book, which is the book of Job. About 3,500 years old, and you can trust it. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. You can trust the word of God. So I want you to know I stand firm on the word of God. If, if somebody tells me something that they cannot back up with the word of God, I dismiss it usually. I dismiss it. Because the Word of God is all-sufficient. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the person of God can be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is what we need in life. And we need to learn to dig into it. We need to find out what we believe and why we believe it. And I'm going to tell you right up front. Over the next few weeks, a lot of what you were taught in kindergarten and first and second grade, you're going to have to throw out. Because it does not match up to what the Word of God says. So I hope your mind is ready to receive from the Word of God what the Bible has to say. It's going to challenge some of your beliefs. It's going to challenge some of what you were taught. And that's okay because that's what the Word of God is. It's a two-edged sword. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's able to go right into the heart of the matter and divide what is false from what is true. Why Paul told Timothy to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, able to rightly divide the word of truth. Not wrongly divide, but rightly divide the word of truth. In other words, you study the word so you know what the truth is. Because how many of you know man will lie? Man will write a book of complete lies and market it and sell it and make millions of dollars and people will build theories and teaching for fact those theories, a.k.a. Charles Darwin. Books are still being sold about the origin of the species. It's being taught in schools that we were once tadpoles. We grew legs, we crawled up, became monkeys, became cavemen, and here we are. Now, I'm just going to tell you, that takes way more faith to believe that, that than it does to just believe that God caused the dust to become man and breathed into his nostrils, and that man stood up a grown man. Don't tell me you don't have faith enough to believe the Word of God. If you believe that other stuff, <laughs> whew, you're like a fish with a hook hung in your mouth. They got you. They got you. Today we're going to begin this series, and I, I'm going to just tell you, it's going to be built on the Bible, and I want you to follow with me. I'm going to show you what we do know from the Bible, facts that we know from the Bible. We're, we're also going to discuss some things that we don't know from the Bible. I'm one of those pastors. I'm not going to stand up here and baffle you with my brilliance. I can't do that. I can't dazzle you with my brilliance, but I'm not going to baffle you with my bull either. I'm going to tell you the truth, and when there's not answers to things, I'm going to tell you, there is no answer. So don't try to make up answers. Don't try to make up things. In other words, don't, don't just fill in the blanks to whatever you think happened, because the truth is we don't know on some things. Can you say amen to that? Let's get into the Word. Beginning in the book of beginnings. That's Genesis. That's literally what it means, the book of beginnings. Now, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. And the Holy Spirit of God, as we know from the Word, moved over Moses and told him what to write. Moses was not there in the beginning. But God told him what to write down so we would have a record of what happened in the beginning. Beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now let's stop for a moment. <clears throat> let's talk about what we do know. We do know that in the beginning, God intentionally created everything. 
It was not some cosmic accident that happened out in space where there was some major explosion and dust particles flew through the atmosphere or flew through the universe, entered our atmosphere, and here I am. Let me tell you something. Intelligent life never comes from nothing. Ever. Ever. There has nothing ever been created, or there's nothing ever that is that was not created by a creator. It just doesn't make sense. Some of you drive vehicles. Okay, matter of fact, I would venture out to say most of you in here drive, except for you guys, don't be driving until it's time, okay? But somebody created that vehicle, did they not? And the millions of parts that it takes to hold a vehicle together was millions, uh, or, or these millions of parts was created by so hundreds, probably hundreds of thousands of different people. There was a creator for this part. They put it together and made it all work. The human body, the creation of the world was put together by one God. In one word, all came into existence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, what we don't know is how long this rock that we live on that's called earth was here before Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. We don't know how long it was here. All right, let me give you, let me explain that. The Bible teaches that God is eternally existent. When someone, a.k.a. God, the only one, who is eternally existent, that means he never had a beginning, and he will never have an end. He has always been, he always will be. So when did he speak this rock into existence? We don't have that answer. We don't know. How long it was floating around in the universe, out in the outer space, before he decided to call it to order and make it life-sustaining. We don't have that information. If we did, maybe we could fill in some blanks, but we don't. Now, that being the case, when we read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2, there are many people out there, and some of them well, well-educated, well-renowned theologians of the Word of God, who believe that there is a gap between verse number 1 and verse number 2. It's commonly referred to as the gap theory, Okay. In other words, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. Now, they say that since God is perfect, that he would not have created a heaven and an earth. The heaven, don't confuse with heaven where your loved ones are. We're talking about heaven, this atmosphere, what we breathe, approximately 100 miles of it. Jets fly up 33,000, 40,000 feet, so sometimes higher than that, into this heaven. This is called the first heaven. When you leave this heaven, go into the ozone atmosphere, whatever, that's considered the second heaven. So the first heaven is the atmosphere that we breathe. God created it in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. Now, the gap theorist says that it would have been created perfect because God doesn't make mistakes. And what they say is that between verse number 1 and verse number 2, something happened that turned the perfect into formless and void condition. Now, did that happen? We don't know. We have no way of knowing. And we're, I'm not going to fill in the blanks and say that it did. But here's what I know. This is what they say. This is what the gap theorist says. And some gap theory people believe that there was life on earth in the first heaven and the first earth. Now, that is 100% speculation because the Bible says Adam was the first man. I'm telling you what the Bible says. Adam was the first man. So if there was something before that, Adam wouldn't have been the first man. Do you, does that make sense? All right, so I don't know. There are some things there that uh, it, it makes sense, but there are some things there that just kind of I don't know. But what they use to base their foundation of a perfect world, a perfect earth and heaven, that something destroyed is found in Isaiah chapter 14. This is Isaiah's account of when Lucifer, the worship leader of heaven, one of the top angels in heaven, 
revolted against God and was cast out of heaven. The Holy Spirit moved upon Isaiah, and here's what he wrote in Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse number 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be thrust down to Sheol. That's an Old Testament word for hell. To the recesses of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. They will ponder over you saying, and here's the part. Is this the man who made the earth tremble? who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a wilderness. Okay? So here's what we know. We know for the fact that Satan was cast out of heaven. We know that. And we know that when he was, something happened here on the earth that caused devastation and desolation. We do know that because we just read it in the book of Isaiah chapter 14. We can't answer any other question other than that. We know something happened. Okay? Now, some believe this is when the world became formless and void. And others believe that that is when Pangea occurred. How many of you know what the word Pangea means? Raise your hand. Okay? In other words, what that belief says is that all the continents were one big landmass at some point in time. Now, I'm going to tell you, and I've done this before. Um, you buy a flat map of the world, you know, and it kind of shows it oval-shaped, and it's got everything spread out like this. If you do that and you cut them apart, you can halfway kind of sort of put them together. And then when you factor in for erosion over the years, blah, 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 you can kind of halfway put it all together as one big mass, land mass that floated apart at some point. Okay? The downside of that is that the continents are not floating. We are not bobbing up and down between the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. Our landmass is connected by the Earth's crust all the way to Russia, all the way to Hawaii, all the way to China, all the way to Italy. We are connected with land masses under us. There is no point where there is nothing there. There is a bottom. Now, it might be miles and miles and miles and miles deep. But there is a bottom at some point. So it's all one land mass. Now, they say that the tectonic, pla tectonic plates moved around and allowed not for thousands of miles it didn't. Okay? But there's some validity to Pangea. You won't find it in the Word of God. So it's one 100% speculation. Do not teach something for fact that cannot be proven. Don't accept something for fact that cannot be proven. Because there is as many arguments against it as there is for it. Do you understand that point? So you have to be careful what you allow yourself to build your, your thoughts and your, 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 your everything on. Your way of of, of operating your life. Be careful. If it cannot be proven, if it cannot be backed up, be careful. All right? So, we, uh, we, we know this happened, okay? So, what we don't know is exactly when Satan fell from heaven. We don't know. We don't have that answer. But what we do know is that he had to have fallen before Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. You get the timeline? He had to have. Because if he hadn't already been thrown out of heaven and landed on the earth and turned the earth into a wilderness, there would have been no sin here. So what would Eve been tempted with if there was no sin here? So Satan had to be cast out of heaven before Adam and Eve sinned. So we do know that. That... that what we don't know, there again, is exactly when Satan was cast out of heaven. We don't have that answer. Okay? If the gap theorists are right, it happened and turned the world into a formless and void rock. And God recreated 
the earth. It's called the re reconstruction theory. And there's a lot of credible people out there who believe that. If a person believes that, I don't have a test of fellowship with that person because he can't prove he's right, but I can't prove he's wrong because we don't have the answers to that. Does that make sense? Look, we would all be better off if we would just use this word. In my opinion, I think it was like this. But instead, we say, no, that's wrong. It was like this. And, and we sound ignorant when we do that. Because if we can't back something up with facts, then we're in trouble. And we're building on something that may not be right. Look, I'm one of those guys, I research, I dig, I study deep. I go way deeper than I have to because I want to know that the way that I think about things are correct. And oh, I used to think certain ways. I used to think this and that. And when I got to research it, I couldn't back up what I thought with the Word of God. And I had to change the way that I thought. So I'm not brave enough to say that there was a definitely a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, but there could have been. And if there was, that could easily explain how people say that this earth is millions of years old. It could easily explain that. The problem comes in when they try to date the earth based on carbon dating, which at the absolute best, carbon dating is flawed, massively flawed. We're going to get into that in a week or so. Massively flawed. There are credible scientists out there who used to use it to date things who now realize it's a joke because you everything depends. There are so many variables in carbon dating. And they have no way of knowing the carbon content and everything else that was used that was existent thousands of years ago. So they're basing things off of what is current here. And it's flawed. And I'll show, you, I'll show you some of that. I'll bring you some of the proof uh, next, next week on that. But what we do know is according to biblical genealogies, mankind's recorded history is somewhere between six and 8,000 years. It's recorded history from the Bible. That's the oldest book in existence of um, of history. And when you follow, when you trace the genealogies back, in other words, so-and-so begat so-and-so and lived 900 years and he had so-and-so, and so-and-so -so lived 900 years and, or 700 years and begat so-and-so and he lived. When you do it all the way back, you come up somewhere between 6,000 and 8,000 years. Okay? That's what we know. That's what we know. And I'm sorry, this thing is giving me a fit today. What we don't know, what we don't know is how long was Adam and Eve in the garden before they sinned? That's what we don't know. We don't have those answers. And I'm going to tell you, when you begin researching that, you will find a plethora of opinions out there and very dogmatic opinions. Some are dogmatic on the fact they were in there seven days and they blew it. And then some are, they were there thousands of years before they blew it. And they're very dogmatic on it. But here's the simple truth. No one except for God knows. It's that simple. But I want you to consider this for a moment. Here's what we know. Adam was 930 years when he died. How do we know that? Genesis 5.5 tells us. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. My dad used to get so mad at me, and he would tell me all the time, son, you need to grow up to be a lawyer. You ask so many questions. I was that guy in seminary. I drove my professors nuts. Because they would teach me something. I'd say, why? Show me that. Why do we believe this? Why are you teaching this? And I would drive them crazy. Because the truth is, a lot of people just believe what they've been taught and they've never researched it for themselves. So I want you to think about this for a moment. Adam was 930 years when he died. So you're automatically going to say, well, from the point God created him till he died was 930 years, or, or was it? 
Remember, Adam and Eve was created by God in the Garden of Eden in a perfect, eternal condition. Eternal. When there is eternal condition, there is no time. There is no dating. That's like if you ask me, how many years old is God? Eternal. No, no, how many years? Eternal. How many years am I going to be in heaven after I die? Forever. There's no, there, you can't put a time on anything. You cannot specify time when it's eternal. So there's a lot of people out there that believe that it's very possible that Adam and Eve were in the garden for a long, long, long time before they sinned. That's a very common belief. And I'm going to tell you, I can't prove it, but I'm inclined to believe that. I can't prove it. I'm not going to teach it for doctrine. But in an eternal condition, there is no aging. There is no years. But the moment a person begins dying, their years are counted. You know that when a child is born, their years begin because they begin dying the day they're born. Now, you may not understand that. You may not want to talk about that. But the truth is, we die our whole life. Are you with me? There's parts and pieces <laughs> going bad. I'm living without parts and pieces inside of me because it went bad. And it died already. So we begin dying the day that we're born. And that's how come we can measure our life in years. He lived to 95 years old. We can do it because there was a beginning point. There was an ending point. But in eternity, you can't number them by years. So let's just suppose for a moment that from the point Adam sinned and began dying, Adam would, and Eve would still be here right now had they not sinned. They would still be here in a perfect condition. And we might be here with them. We might be in a perfect position. Had, now, I'm just going to tell you, by the time they got to me, I would have wrecked it for all mankind because I know I'd have sinned by the time I was like three. But what I can tell you is this. What we know is that from the point Adam began dying, we know this for the fact, he lived 930 years. Could he have lived before that? We don't know. If he does, if he did, that would answer a lot of questions about a lot of things. I'm not a person who believes that science and the Bible are always in conflict because they are not. Look, there have been some great things accomplished through science. Uh, some great things. I am thankful that we don't battle polio like they did back in the 40s and 50s, and I'm thankful for that. I've got a friend that was affected by polio when he was a young man and his legs about that much shorter one than the other and he's got a crippled up arm because he had polio as a child. I'm thankful we don't have to deal with that and we can contribute that to science and I'm okay with that. I'm thankful that, that they're making breakthroughs and extending people's lives that have cancer now. Radiation and chemo. I'm thankful for that. Look, my brother died of cancer but his treatments gave us another five, seven years with him. And I'm thankful for those treatments. Whereas if they didn't exist, he'd have died seven years earlier. So I don't, I don't throw science out until it contradicts the Bible. When it begins contradicting the Word of God, then I throw it out. And I don't pay any attention to it. And I'll tell you, I'm one, I'll discredit something that fast if it's contrary to the Word of God. I don't have any issues doing that. So we have to know what we believe, we have to know what the Bible says and why it says that. So, if Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden for quite some time before sin, that would explain some things. We're going to talk about it next week. Somewhat. Remember, even after sin entered the world, Methuselah lived 969 years. Adam was 930 years. All right? We make it to 90. We feel like we've done something. That's only 10% of what they were living, and there's reasons for that, and we'll talk about it. We'll talk about that in this series as well. But when Adam 
sinned, Adam brought forth death. Now I want you to listen to me, and I want you to listen to me careful because this is going to be the jumping off point next week. Before Adam sinned, listen carefully, before Adam sinned, nothing had ever died. Do you get that? Before Adam sinned, nothing had ever died. If you believe that, say amen. So what do we do when they teach us that the dinosaurs were here and died before Adam and Eve? Next week. Next week. Let me tell you something. Adam brought forth death. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. What we know, Adam brought death into the world. The first death recorded in the Bible, and it's kind of in an obscure location. I believe it's around chapter 3, chapter 4, 5. I'd have to go back. My random access ain't going there right now. God made Adam and Eve clothes of skin. In order to clothe someone with skin, something had to die. That is the first death recorded in the Bible. All right? So before then, we don't find death before sin. We do not find death. So, is it possible? Is it possible that... Adam and Eve lived right alongside the dinosaurs. Is it possible that dinosaurs existed and we can find them in the Bible? Is that possible? Absolutely, positively, and I'll show you next week. There are dinosaurs in the Bible. Job talked about them. Other writers talked about dinosaurs. Now, they weren't called dinosaurs until about 100 years ago. They were under different names. But we're going to show you, and what I want you to do is go back and begin reevaluating because in preschool you were told that dinosaurs lived millions and millions of years ago and they died out and then man came along. That cannot be if the Bible is correct. It just can't be. All right? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying you agree with it. I'm just saying do you understand what I'm saying from a biblical perspective it cannot be. So we have to figure out, okay, are we going to believe what flawed carbon dating type of setups are telling us, or are we going to believe the Word of God? Because credible scientists, and I'm going to give you just a little bit more teaser for next week. Credible scientists will tell you that when the whole world was covered with water, a.k.a. Noah and the flood, when the whole earth was covered with water, the pressure that would have been put on what we now call the fossils would have been immense. And the 40 days and the 40 nights that it rained, the whole earth was covered in water for about a year. And the pressure that that water would have put on bones and stuff easily fossilized everything. So is it possible... We're going to talk about that some next week. But here's what we know. We know that Adam brought forth death. But we also know that Jesus brought forth life. We just finished up our study of 1 Corinthians on Wednesday nights. And um, uh, what we do during the summer, we have Wednesday night Bible study for everybody here. And then as it ends, the, the summer ends, September comes, we go into life groups, which is small groups that meet in different locations. Quite a few of them meet here on the church property. Some of them meet in homes and various and sundry nights of the week. And, um, but we just finished up our Wednesday Bible study, summer study series out of 1 Corinthians. And one of the passages of Scripture that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 said this, verse 21, beginning in verse 21. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Here's what we know. 
Adam brought forth death. Jesus brings forth life. Jesus is referred to in the Bible as the second Adam. Matter of fact, some of the Christmas songs we sing in the verses, you know, those obscure verses that only the independent Baptists sing all five of, or the Methodists, I think y'all used to sing all five of them, you know. Church of Christ, they might sing all five of them, I'm not really sure. But in some of those obscure verses of old Christmas hymns, it talks about the second Adam from above. Joy to the world is one of them. And Jesus is referred to as the second Adam. For as by one man sin entered the world, but Jesus brings life. So, although I'm going to give you a lot of information and a lot of, hmm, making you think, I'm not trying to tell you how to think. I'm just trying to help you to open your mind and say, wow, I never thought about it from that perspective before. And then you'll begin researching and you'll begin looking into the Word of God to find answers. That's my goal. But at the end of the day, I want to show you Jesus. Because the Bible says He is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to get to the Father. Look, those that follow Islam will claim that they have the way. Those that follow Buddhism will claim they have the way. Those that follow the Hindus will claim they have the way. Those that follow Oprah Winfrey claim that they have the way. I, I think it's funny, and I hear you laughing, but it's the truth. She says that Jesus is a way to get to heaven. No, no. The Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. That was Jesus speaking. Jesus is the only Lord that resurrected. He's the only Lord that you can't go and find his dust or his bones still there. So Jesus is ultimately what we want to point to. In the beginning, God. John chapter 1, I love. John chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. What does that mean? That means Jesus was in the beginning. And Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us and paid the price for sin so that we could have redemption and payment in full for our sin. You see, Jesus is the answer. And that's what I want us to always understand. We can get hung up and, and look, I'm a prophecy teacher. Oh, I love teaching prophecy. Oh, I live, eat, breathe, and sleep prophecy. But I can't get so caught up in that that I forget that there's a world who needs Jesus right now. I love teaching series like this, just where people can stop and think about what we've been told versus what the Bible actually says. But I don't want to get so caught up in that that I forget that this world needs Jesus. Your family needs Jesus. Your neighbors need Jesus. Your coworkers need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Amen.